evening. I'm Geneva Henry. I'm the Dean of Libraries and Academic Innovation here at George Washington University. Um, welcome. This will be a very exciting evening. Um, I'm delighted that all of you could make it uh, to this event, and I'm quite pleased to welcome you to the space, the National Churchill Library and Center. Um, this space was created through the generous donation uh, from the International Churchill Society, and we uh, use this for events that really highlight the values that Sir Winston stood for. Um, it stands as a, a place and is used by a space as a space um, by our students who um, find a lot of inspiration in many of the values that uh, we look to Winston Churchill for. Um, he was a pretty remarkable leader in a lot of ways. He was very human. Um, there are things about him uh, that I, I find fascinating. His ability to fail epically and always pick himself right back up and lead over and over again. That's probably my favorite feature of him. But um, the way he, he knew how to reach out to people, build coalitions, um, and be a genuine collaborator. Uh, he believed in the values uh, that we cherish. Um, he believed in freedom. Uh, in his heart of hearts, uh, he believed in uh, doing what you can and helping wherever you can. Uh, he had a sense of humor about him uh, and a seriousness uh, and a drive that led him to always do the best he could. Uh, and that's what we aspire to at George Washington University. It's the values we want our, our students to aspire to, um, to see themselves in a global society. So um, I'm delighted that we have uh, Mr. David Rubenstein here tonight uh, to talk with us because uh, he too uh, also embodies these values and is a perfect speaker for this space and for addressing uh, the issues we face today. Um, Mr. Rubenstein is the co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlisle, Carlisle Group, which was uh, co-founded in 1987. Uh, he is the chairman of the board of trustees of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the Smithsonian Institution, uh, and the Council on Foreign Relations, a fellow at the Harvard Corporation, a trustee of the National Gallery of Art, many additional institutions, uh, including uh, the Brookings Institution, World Economic Forum, and President of the Economic Club of Washington. Uh, he has served as the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Duke University uh, and is an original signer of the Giving Pledge, a significant donor to all of the above-mentioned nonprofit organizations and recipient of the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy. He received the Theodore Roosevelt Wilson, uh, Woodrow Wilson Award from the American Historical Association in 2013. Mr. Rubenstein has been a leader in the area of patriotic philanthropy, having made transformative gifts for the restoration or repair of the Washington Mon Monument, Monticello, Mount Pierre, uh, Mount Vernon, pretty much any monument here in Washington, uh, the African American History and Culture Museum, uh, and the list goes on and on. I think in this community, we know him well, and we appreciate uh, the, all that he has done uh, for those monuments that we cherish and that mean so much to the entire nation. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Rubenstein is the host of the David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversation on Bloomberg TV and PBS. Uh, he is a native of Baltimore, a 1970 magna cum laude graduate of Duke University, and a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, where he was an editor in the Law Review. So for tonight's event, uh, we have the director of the National Churchill Library and Center, uh, Michael Bishop, uh, who is the inaugural uh, director. Um, and he also wears a second hat as being the executive director of the International Churchill Society. Uh, so Michael will lead a conversation with Mr. Rubenstein and then provide some opportunities uh, for all of you to engage in that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Geneva. In the
two years since we opened the library, we've welcomed many people like yourselves, students and visitors, and shared with them access to the entire Churchill Archive online, books, arts, documents and artifacts, and other uh, things related to Churchill. But we've also had a series of conversations with fascinating figures like David Petraeus, novelist Robert Harris, historians Neil Ferguson and Tim Snyder, the actor Gary Oldman, and many others, to talk not only about the details of Winston Churchill's life and career, but their application to our present day challenges. Because as Churchill himself said, the longer you can look back, the farther you can look forward. We're very privileged to have David Rubenstein with us tonight, someone who is uh, concerned not only with the affairs of today, but also with those of the past as well. Thank you very much for being My with us. to be here. Um, I'd like to begin by casting our minds back nearly 40 years ago to a moment when, in the White House, you sat down on the day after the 1980 presidential election to map out what your boss, President Jimmy Carter, would do for the remainder of his term. Could you share with us, first of all, what was it like to be at the center of power? And what was it like to see that power begin to drain away as it did for Winston Churchill after his defeat in 1945? Well, for those who are too young to have lived through the uh, Carter years, let me just remind you, Jimmy Carter was a one-term governor of Georgia. Um, in those days, if you were a Southerner, you weren't thought likely to be a candidate to be president of the United States. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was seen as a Westerner because he's from Texas. So a Southerner was not taken seriously in most people's view to be president of the United States. But he finished being governor in 1974, and he had this idea that he could run for president. And it was a very novel idea. In fact, many people came to him and said, you know, you should run for vice president. And they said, no, I'm running for president. So he had this brilliant idea of moving to Iowa. He spent 108 days in Iowa. This is before Iowa became as big a deal as it, as it has since become. So he goes to Iowa, 108 days. He does pretty well in Iowa. People did, said that he won Iowa, but he really, really didn't. Undecided won Iowa. Uh, undecided got about 60% of the vote. Carter got about 20% of the vote, but he came in second. But he managed to, managed to get the headlines to say Carter won. <laughs> so that propelled him to uh, New Hampshire, and he won New Hampshire, and then was off to the races. So he gets elected. He is a novel person. He, had, he coined the idea or, or came up with the idea of saying, I'm not from Washington, D.C. That was novel because generally people would say, I have a lot of experience. I'm qualified to be president. He said, I'm not from Washington. I'm not a lawyer and many other things that, that became well known. I'll give your government as good as the American people. I will not lie to you. So he became president and his presidency was uh, impaired by some uh, problems. The, we had high inflation. We had gas, gasoline shortages. We had gas lines. We also had uh, economic slowdown, and then we had the hostages. So uh, Carter um, was a very smart man. He worked very hard. He could read and write extremely well. He read everything. He just wasn't able to project the kind of image that maybe he wanted to project. And despite all that, we thought we would win the election. Because when you are at the center of power in the White House, you always think the best information comes to you. And since you make the decisions based on the, on the best information, you think, well, if only everybody else knew what I knew, they would make the same decision. But I know all the good information, so I'm making the right decisions. And eventually, the American people will figure this out. So we said in the White House in those days, well, we know we're not that popular. We have hostages in Iran. Uh, there's gas lines. There's uncertainty about our energy future and so forth. But one thing we know is if we run against Ronald Reagan, we can win. Uh, I, at the time, was 31 years old. I was the deputy domestic policy advisor. But I said, I know we can beat Ronald Reagan because he's 69 years old, ready for a nursing home. Uh, I'm now 69. It doesn't look as old uh, today um, as it did then. But we thought we could beat him because we figured he's an actor. He didn't know anything. Carter was much smarter. Surely the American people will vote for the smarter person. That obviously doesn't happen all the time. But that's my view at the time. Um, so, um, so one day, we're you know, running the country. The President of the United States is making the decisions. And there's nothing quite like the power of being President of the United States. Uh, we, we, we flew out to the last campaign. They were in the West Coast. And we thought we were going to win. And the last night before the election, uh, Pat Cadell, the pollster for Carter, called him and said, uh, everything is dropping out because you tried to get the hostages out. The last minute you failed. And it reminded people of your impotence and not being able to get the hostages out. So you're going to lose by a landslide. 
So Carter flew across the country to vote in planes. Uh, he had called his wife, told her she was crying when she greeted him. People say, why are you crying? Well, she knew they were going to lose. Came back to Washington that night. We went to the um, victory party, but we knew it wasn't going to be a victory party. Carter um, uh, basically conceded at 9 o'clock at night before the polls had closed in the West Coast, which hurt some people there. So the next day, what does everybody do? The next day we say we have to polish off our resumes because you have to start life all over again. But Carter decided that he wasn't going to waste the period of time uh, between then and the January 20th inauguration. He was going to get things done. And so we actually got more things done in the, in the transition period of time than probably we did in the previous year. He got legislation through. And one of the reasons was the Democrats knew that, that the Republicans were going to take control of the Senate once he left. And therefore, um, they wouldn't be able to get certain things that, through the Congress then. So they passed things that they really didn't uh, do when Carter was there because Congress was going to change. And therefore, um, they, they got things passed in the, in the lame duck session. And Carter did a lot of uh, heroic things in the Alaska lands area and energy. Um, so, the, the, but you know, realize then that all of a sudden power is moving away from you. One day you're at the center of power, and then every day you have less and less power. And then, of course, you realize it's all over on January 20th. Uh, Carter did spend a lot of time during the transition trying to get the hostages out. And we didn't know it at the time. We now, we now know it. But at the time, we thought Carter would be easier to deal with for the Iranians than Reagan, who was seen as a tougher person on some of these kind of issues. But the hostages, hostage takers had the view that we now know that Carter, because he had let the Shah into the United States, was the uh, devil incarnate. And anybody would be better than Carter. So they were determined to not release the hostages until Carter was no longer in office, and they mm -hmm. did the day, that day that he, was, um, <clears throat> he left office. So it was a, a bittersweet kind of feeling. One day you're riding hot, you're helping to run the country. The next day you're, people are saying, hey, you've done a, such a bad job, get out of there, and you still have a couple months to go. Um, for personal points of view, it was one day people come in to say, you're a bright young person, and when you ever want a job, call me up. Then when you call them after you lose election, they don't return your call because, you know, if you're a dead man, you know, you're a dead man in Washington when you have no power. And as Harry Truman said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. So all the, all the people who said to me, you're a bright young man, call me up. I've been, I was calling those people and they never called back. So, you know, maybe someday they'll call me back. They didn't call me back. <laughs> well, I've been recently reading Stu Eisenstadt's excellent new book about President Carter. So it's been on my mind and, and you, you feature prominently in the book. And I just thought I'd ask you, uh, with the passage of time, and as someone who was right there during the entire presidency, what do you think of President Carter's historical stature okay. at this stage? Let me, for again, for the young people here, um, Stuart Eisenstadt was my boss. I was 27 <coughs> years old. I was the Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor to the President of the United States. I wasn't qualified for the job, but many people weren't qualified for their jobs. And this is a tradition we have in our country. Many people in White House staffs are not qualified for the jobs. So I had a job. I wasn't qualified for it, but I, I enjoyed it. My boss was actually qualified. He was 34 years old. He had actually worked in the Johnson White House. He had worked with Carter for a while. He actually knew policy pretty well. Um, he um, had a, very, a habit that I, I don't know anybody else has ever had. He was able to go through meetings for four years at the White House. And as he was having the meetings and talking to people and listening, he would write everything down on a legal pad. Anybody calls him, he has a thing on a legal pad. So at the end of the administration, he had several hundred legal pads with everything that had been said. And, and it was a great... Uh, uh, way to kind of remind himself what was going on. So he spent about the last 40 years talking to people about what happened, what went wrong, and for the last seven years he's write, written a book. It took him seven years to finish it. He had, I think, about 500 interviews. Uh, it's the most exhaustive book about the Carter uh, administration. Or the, and, and what he concludes is that Carter made some serious mistakes. He did some good things. But that basically, if you lose an election in this country uh, after one term, in other words, in our, our system, Presidents are considered successful largely if they have uh, one term, get reelected, second term. We don't have a system where to prove that you are good, you run for reelection, you win, then you can say, I, I won, and so I don't have to serve the next four years. You have to serve the next four years. And many presidents get tired, and the second four years isn't as good as the first four years. Carter was one of the presidents who didn't win a second term. George Her uh, Herbert Walker Bush didn't win a second term, and, and Gerald Ford didn't really win a, a term. So when you lose your, after the first term, you're considered a failure. And so Carter was considered a failure because he lost by so much to Reagan. Reagan came in and said Carter did so many bad things and blamed everything bad that happened subsequently on Carter. So, so Carter's popularity went down so low that, I remember in 1984 at the Democratic Convention, 
he really didn't want to come to the convention because he was afraid that people would boo him. And, you know, he wasn't really interested in, in being booed. So he was still very, very unpopular. Stewart's book basically says, yes, Carter made some mistakes, but he did some things that are very important. Um, got the Panama Canal treaties through, uh, a great political uh, feat to do that. He created the Department of Energy, Department of Education. He created that. He got civil service reform through. Um, he actually uh, did some things that uh, in, in foreign policy that were important today, uh, talking about human rights in foreign policy, which was an important uh, you know, thing in those days and still is. Um, he was also somebody who recognized China officially. Richard Nixon obviously made the historic trip, but the official recognition of Card occurred under the Carter administration. So he did many good things, but because he did so many good things after he left the presidency, and his presidency was such a long time ago, and he didn't get reelected, people think that Carter was a not successful president. His ex-presidency um, is incredible. He's been an ex-president for essentially 40 years. Actually, 37 years he's been an ex-president, the longest anybody's ever lived after they left the White House. It was 37 years. And during that period of time, Carter has actually done some incredible things. He helped eliminate river blindness in Africa, guinea worm in Africa, uh, election mon monitoring. And so the Carter Center has actually done so many good things that it makes his administration look insignificant. He was an ex-president for almost 40 years and president only four years. So the contrast is there's so many good things to talk about in the last 40 years and fewer things people would say in the first four years. But the book is one that if anybody is really interested in those years, and I realize you have to be obsessive, compulsive to read a 915-page book <laughs> about uh, Jimmy Carter. Um, it is a very well-done book. Thank you very much. Uh, as long as we're on the subject of leadership, I'd like to ask you a question I've heard you ask many others. First of all, what makes a great leader? And secondly, who were the leaders in modern history who loom largest for you? And is Winston Churchill among them? No pressure. <laughs> well, the, the people have debated for many, many years uh, are leaders born or are they educated and made? And obviously there's no easy answer to that. Some people are raised in a way where they're, they're taught they're going to be a leader because they come from a prominent family or they have parents that are just determined to make them uh, leaders. Other people come to it late in life and you wouldn't have expected them to ever be a leader. Um, and so I don't think there's any easy answer. I, I, my TV show called Peer to Peer, it's on Bloomberg, in every one of the interviews, I try to ask people, what made you a leader? What are the key elements of it? And I'm now putting together a book that will take the excerpts of those interviews and focus on what these people say about what made them leaders. Um, I interviewed you know, many, many people for that program and for other things. And I would say the people who are great leaders are people who are willing to fail, take a risk. They are willing to be unpopular. They tend to have one of three abilities to persuade people. In other words, all of life is about persuading people. You think about it, nobody can do anything by themselves, nothing. You have to persuade somebody to let you do something, your partner, your spouse, your business associate, your whatever it might be. Professor, persuade your professor that your exam is good or, or persuade your parents to do something. Whatever it is, you have to persuade somebody. There are three ways to do it. And as a leader, you have to learn one of these three ways. If you can do all three, you're terrific. One, learn how to communicate orally. So great speakers are often great, uh, great leaders are often great speakers. So Martin Luther King is a great speaker, John Kennedy a great speaker. Many people who are uh, well known are great speakers. If you can't do that, learn how to write where well. Uh, Churchill was both a great public speaker and a great writer. So he rarely, uh, he did something that people rarely do, combine both of them. A third way to be a great leader and the most effective way is by example. So when George Washington, um, the uh, person after whom this university is named, when, when uh, Valley Forge occurred in 1777, he stayed there with his troops. It was, you know, people may forget, but the bizarre way that they fought wars in the old days was you fought them in the summer and the spring, and then winter you kind of just hibernated. You didn't fight in the winter because it was too cold, I guess. So when the winter came, they, all the, the British troops stayed where they were in New York, and the American troops would stay, let's say, Philadelphia. In this, in this particular Sorry. case, um, they're sitting for winter, so the troops are in Valley Forge, a suburb of Philadelphia, more or less. Uh, George Washington could have stayed at the, at the Ritz-Carlton equivalent, or wherever, if there was one then. He didn't have to stay with his troops. The troops were barely clothed, barely fed, but he stayed there, and he led by example. So if you're going to be a leader, learn how to communicate orally, learn how to communicate by writing, or lead how to, learn how to communicate by um, example. Winston Churchill, really, I guess you could say, did all three. One... He was a brilliant writer and the only person who's probably ever won a Nobel Prize for nonfiction literature. He won the Nobel Prize for literature, 
But most people who win that, I think all, generally with maybe one exception, have won it for, uh, for fiction. Uh, second, uh, he was an incredible public speaker, as we know, and uh, people still quote you know, his famous speeches, and some of the most famous speeches of all time were given by Winston Churchill. And third, he was a leader uh, who was willing to lead by example. So he would stay in dangerous places when, when uh, Britain was being bombed by the, by the Nazis. He wouldn't go out to the suburbs. He would stay in downtown London at, in a bomb shelter, but he was willing to stay there with people. Uh, he was willing to, when he was a younger man, go in with his troops and fight. As you may know, as a young man, he actually went into combat at times. So he was a person who led by many, many different ways, and I think was, sort of, you know, certainly in the 20th century, would be considered one of the, you know, three, four, five most important leaders of the 20th century, without doubt. Well, we certainly agree here. I'd like to switch to another topic now, the economy, one with which you concern yourself uh, on a daily basis. Uh, the economy is doing, as you've said yourself recently, doing pretty well. Uh, President Trump has been very quick to take credit for this. I wonder to what extent uh, should he take some credit? What policies of his, economically speaking, right. do you support or not? And do you think there are other dynamics going on? Is there too much capital chasing too few opportunities and leading to excess valuations? Well, President Trump would be a rare president who didn't take credit for something good that happened during his uh, time. Uh, as President Obama pointed out the other day, he, he left him an economy that was in reasonably good shape, and many of the tough decisions that President Obama made um, have now come back to help President Trump. The economy is in very good shape by any traditional measure. We're growing at, uh, for the year, we'll grow at 3%, last quarter 4.2%. Unemployment is 3.9%, as low as it's been in quite some time. The inflation rate's relatively low. Um, the dollar is strong. Uh, we, we have rarely seen an economy quite this good. Now, the, the bad news when you have an economy quite this good is it can't last forever. So uh, typically, in World War, since World War II, we've had recessions every seven years on average. We've never gone more than 120 months without a recession. Um, that was during the, the Clinton years, mostly. And uh, now we're about 110 months with no uh, recession or economic growth. It's unlikely that it's going to go on forever, but right now nobody that I'm aware of who's a professional economist would say they see any sign of a recession in 2018 or 2019. One of the reasons is if you borrow a lot of money, you can stimulate the economy. So we borrowed an extra $1.5 trillion in the tax cut bill, and that probably will keep the economy in reasonable good shape for a while. Now, we have to pay the price at some point. We, own, we have $21 trillion of indebtedness, federal indebtedness. And, and that is a big problem. Plus, we have pension and Social Security and Medicare and uh, Medicaid liabilities that are going to be quite expensive going forward. As the baby boomers live longer and longer, 10,000 baby boomers turn 65 every single day. As they live longer and longer, we're going to have problems with Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. For example, when, Medi when, when Social Security was first set up in 1933 or 4, there were roughly, uh, I think, about 23 workers for every retiree. Now there's about two and a half workers for every retiree. And people lived on average up to about 65 in those days. Days Now the average life expectancy is closer to 80. So we've got some problems we have to deal with. But for the immediate future, the economy is in, in pretty good shape. I, I do think that the tax cut probably was, um, I would say it was geared up to certain elements of society that probably didn't need as much tax benefit as they got. Uh, I think we've got to deal with the entitlement problems shortly. Uh, interest rates are going up, that will be a bit of a challenge. I, I think that the obsession with the trade deficit is a bit mysterious to people because it's a budget deficit we should worry about. The trade deficit is something that very few economists really worry about. We could solve the trade deficit tomorrow by simply saying to Americans, save more, don't buy so much, and then the trade deficit will go down. But we don't want to say that because it's not a popular thing to do. <laughs> um, so right now, I'm, I'm pretty happy with where the economy is. I just think we have to be prepared that at some point in the next two, three years, you'll see the economy going down. It just can't keep going on this way forever, and we have to be prepared for it. Mm. Now, you mentioned trade. We're in the middle of a trade war, or at least a trade spat with right. China. Uh, free trade is a, it's a tricky issue. Most economists agree that it's a good thing, but there's been a great deal of populist uh, resentment and backlash 
uh, with the spread of globalization. Right. It's, a, it's an issue that has plagued uh, American politics, British politics. It's driven part of Winston Churchill's career. His conversion from the conservatives to the liberals in 1904 was driven in part by the issue of free trade. Uh, can you tell us how can those who support free trade do a better job of explaining its benefits and maybe mitigating some of its downsides? Well, there's no doubt that globalization has been taken by many people to mean um, shipping jobs offshore. So many people in the industrial Midwest have been very much against the so-called globalization of the last 10, 20 years or so. And while our economy is well, relatively wealthy and, and average incomes have gone up, uh, income has not gone up for many people in our society, and so they are not happy with it. I think we have to do a much better job of explaining that without globalization, without um, free trade, we'd be much worse than we are today. For example, uh, in the Carter years, we had inflation of 19 percent. That wasn't that popular. We've had inflation in recent years of maybe 2 percent. Why is it? Well, because we now we have so many products from over, overseas coming into our country at relatively low prices that we, our Americans can buy more things at cheaper prices than, than if everything had to be manufactured here. But getting people to understand that and, and feel sympathetic to that view is, is not that easy. Hmm. Um, President Trump um, does seem to have an obsession with the trade deficit. And most economists don't agree that the trade deficit is as big a problem as the budget deficit. Uh, for the time being, we, we have some spats with the Chinese, uh, the Japanese, um, the Europeans, I don't think we're going to have a, uh, uh, a, a trade war in a long, sustained way, because I don't think uh, there's as much appetite for that in Congress or even in the White House for a long trade war. I think everything is on the table, and I think we'll probably negotiate something with the Chinese in the not-too-distant future that will eliminate that problem. I'd like to, uh, to turn back to Churchill again and talk to you about the idea of uh, regrets. Even great men have regrets. Churchill lamented later in life that he had worked very hard and accomplished a great deal in the end to accomplish nothing. Now, of course, his achievements were absolutely stupendous, as are yours. But I wonder, are there any business or other opportunities that have come up that you have managed to pass by or miss? And do you ever look back and say, oh, I wish I'd done that? Some people um, never look back, um, and um, they just uh, say, look, I always look to the future. I cannot resist looking back. I cannot resist it. So let me mention a couple of my terrible failures. Um, the other day, I mentioned one in a public setting. It'll be on a TV show tomorrow night, and uh, some of you may have seen it. It's on the Internet. I interviewed Jeff Bezos, and let me give you my background with him. Um, we owned a company at Carlisle called Baker & Taylor. It was the second biggest book distributor in the United States, started in 1839. It had not made a profit since 1839. It was always break-even. <laughs> it had, the, though, the biggest bibliography of books in print. So um, a salesman came to one of our board meetings at Baker and & Taylor and said, guess what, I found a new way to make revenue, not just distributing books. Some idiot showed up, and he wanted to rent our bibliography um, for uh, a, book, <laughs> a company he was going to set up to sell books over the Internet. And, and this guy came in, apparently, and he said he didn't have a lot of cash, but he'd give us a third of the company if we would only, you know, let him use the bibliography. The salesman said, hey, we're, we're too smart for that. We want $100,000 a year, real cash. So that's the deal we did. Then I was reading in the newspaper, <laughs> uh, about a year or two later, I was reading the newspaper about a guy who was going to sell books over the Internet, and the company was called Amazon. So I said, I called the salesman and said, hey, there might be another idiot who wants to rent this bibliography. He said, no, that's the original idiot that we got. So... I said, well, geez, you know, I don't know if that's a good deal, $100,000 a year, but I think this company's taking off, and I think they could go public, and we should take the third of the company. He said, well, it might be too late. I said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So I flew out to Seattle to meet Jeff Bezos, and he was in a ramshackle office building, and he, those days, if you ordered a book on Amazon, um, he would then take the order and order it from the publisher. They would then send it to him, and he would send it out to you. You get it two weeks later. And he was keeping the books in his little office, and he would, every day he would take it to the mail, uh, the, the post office. So I said, Jeff... Um, you know, I think that uh, I'd rather have that deal as one-third of the company, not 100000 a year. And he said, well, David, this, that was two years ago. I don't need you as much anymore, but you were helpful, so I'm going to give you some stock, and we'll, we'll call it a day. So he gave us some stock, and at the IPO, we sold it, and today that stock is worth about $5 billion. So that was one of my mistakes. Um, <laughs> another one was this. When my daughter was an undergraduate at Harvard, she met a young man that she's now married to, and uh, that young man... Um, 
was a classmate at Phillips Exeter and also at Harvard with a guy that was going to drop out and start a company. And he explained this to me, and I said, this company will never get anywhere. That was Facebook. So I had a chance to invest the original $10 million in Facebook, and um, I didn't do that. That $10 million is worth about $50 billion today. And the last one I'll mention is that one time, a, a CEO who had been a CEO of a company called Silicon Graphics shows up at Carlisle's office with a shaggy-haired kid in jeans and sandals, and he says, we're going to start a new company that's going to help people navigate the Internet. And they said, well, what's the Internet? And they said, well, it's this new thing that's going to come out, and you can do things over it. And I said, look, you know, this, what does this kid do? He says, well, he invented it. He's a student at the University of Illinois. And what's the company called? It's called Mosaic, but we're going to ultimately they change it to Netscape. And uh, he wanted a very high valuation of like $125 million for a company that hadn't even started. Mm. And we said, look, we're pretty smart here. That's not worth $125 million, maybe $70 million. So we couldn't reach an agreement. They did it with somebody else. That became the company that was sold to AOL for $4.5 billion at one point. Uh, and that was Mark Andreessen, who's now become one of the most famous uh, venture capitalists. So I've made a lot of my mistakes. And unlike some people, I cannot get them out of my system. So um, I just keep yeah. thinking about them. It's like the fish that got away. Yeah. Some fishermen fish, <laughs> like to talk about it. I can't resist talking about them. Because I made. And I made a lot of mistakes. In, in the Bezos interview, uh, he made it clear that that despite his, his success and all that he has to do, he, he tries to make sure to get eight hours of sleep a night. A colleague yes. of yours told me, you only get four or five. Do you think if you got more sleep, you'd be more successful? Well, I'm thinking about that. You know, that stunned a lot of people because most business people in our country have this macho feeling that they have to get by on very few hours of sleep because they're so busy they can't get by on just on, on if they had eight hours, that they'd be missing things. So I, I probably actually get you know, maybe five or six hours a night. But I've been thinking how much wealthier I could be if I was getting eight <laughs> hours a night. But Jeff has explained that he sleeps. He goes to sleep at nine o'clock, gets up, uh, gets eight hours sleep, gets up early, and then he then he kind of uh, putters around the house, spends time with his kids, and and then he gets in the office, you know, later than most people who are as wealthy as he is, I guess. And he's the wealthiest man in the world, so nobody's as wealthy. But he um, doesn't start any meeting before ten o'clock, and he thinks actually in the early afternoon he's tired, so he doesn't have any big meetings after uh, maybe noon or two or three or something like that. So it stunned people, um, and I, to be very serious, uh, uh, clearly there, have, there are scientific studies that show that on average a person really does need about eight hours of sleep a night. Some people can get by with seven, but um, you know, if you sleep too much, it's not healthy. If you don't get enough sleep, it's not healthy, but mm -hmm. eight hours seems to be the right number, and I you know, wish I could get more sleep, <laughs> but uh, sometimes I, I do. Uh, your, your philanthropy is, is legendary, and you are particularly well-known, as, as Geneva mentioned earlier, for focusing on historical sites and right. institutions. Right. Uh, Churchill admonished many people, study history, study history. He believed that in history lie all the secrets of statecraft. What does history mean to you and what drives you to the generosity that you've displayed in the world of well, history? Well, most of my philanthropy, which is modest compared to what Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates do, I don't have their wealth, but most of my philanthropy, honestly, goes to education and medical research mm. and cultural kinds of things. But because very few people are doing what I'm doing in history, it gets attention. So when the Washington Monument had its earthquake damage, I offered to put up the money to fix it. And you know, it wasn't a staggering sum by, by, by uh, philanthropic standards. It was $15 million. And I said, OK, I'm happy to do that. It stunned some people that a private citizen would do that. And I just thought it would be quicker and wouldn't have to deal with the government and the slowdowns. Uh, the Congress actually got upset. They said, we don't get any credit for doing anything good because we put up half the money. So I said, fine. So they did. Um, so I, I started, in the end, I, didn't, I put up some, uh, some additional money to help fix it a little bit later. But in the end, or the, take the Lincoln Memorial. The Lincoln Memorial has kind of got some problems. The roof is falling. And I wanted to build an underground education center so people could learn about Lincoln if they went to the, to the uh, memorial. So I put up, I think it's like $16 million or maybe $20 million um, uh, to fix it. But... That's still small compared to the amount of money that Bill Gates is giving away a year, away, you know, four billion dollars a year. So my gifts have have gotten attention because nobody else seems to be want to do these kind of things in, in the kind of scale that I'm doing it. The reason it's important to me is this: I think that uh, I came from very modest circumstances, and now, you know, with my last name and with my, you know, all my failings, to be able to have the wealth that I have to give back to their country, I want to be able to do that to say thank you for my success in this country, and I owe it to the country. So this is one way of 
doing it, and I'm doing it in a way that's designed to remind people of our history and heritage. My fear is that we don't teach history very much anymore, mm -hmm. and people feel they have to take a STEM course in order to get a job. So they turn it, they study history, they're not going to get a job or not as good a paying job. As a, so as a result is we don't know very much about our history. And you find things like this. Uh, surveys will show that uh, when Americans are asked what river did George Washington cross during the Revolutionary War, 40% will say the Rhine River, uh, which is not the case. Um, and it turns out that people know so little about our government. Yesterday was Constitution Day, and I spoke at James Madison University, and I pointed out that 75% of Americans cannot name the three branches of government, and more than 30% of Americans cannot even name one branch of government, and 10% of college graduates believe that Judge Judy is on the United States Supreme Court, <laughs> uh, which is not yet the case. So, um, <laughs> so I, I'm trying to... My theory is that if, if we have... If the historic documents I bought, like the Magna Carta or other things, if people have a chance to go see them, before they go see it or after they see it, they might study the Magna Carta or the Declaration of Independence more and learn more about it. If we have more informed citizens, it's a better um, thing for us. Or the same with monuments. If, the, if Monticello or Montpelier is better uh, suited for, for tourists to come, more will come. We'll learn more about Thomas Jefferson or James Madison. We'll have a more informed citizenry. And that's what we need because we don't know that much about our history right now and very little about uh, our government, for example. I think most people who uh, are native-born Americans could not pass the citizenship test that immigrants have to pass when they um, want to become citizens. Now, the immigrants study for the test, but 91% pass. Um, in, if most people in our country, if they were given the citizenship test that immigrants have to take and they weren't able to study for it, I'm sure we'd have about a 90% failure rate. It's just a sad situation. So I think we should try to g get people to learn more about our country and our history. Uh, as George Santayana, the famous Harvard historian, said, those people who don't re remember history are condemned to relive it. So we want to avoid some of the mistakes we've made in the past. Mm. Now, before I open things up for questions, I'd like to ask one more rather serious question on behalf of my better half, who, like you, is from Baltimore. Is there anything that can be done about the Orioles <laughs> at all? I don't know if I can say this publicly. So, but <laughs> I, but that, look, um, we won't tell anyone. I think uh, the, when I was growing up, the Orioles were, were pretty good. They you know, won a number of World Series, and um, it was a different situation then. We had some of the best players that baseball's ever seen. Brooks Robinson, uh, obviously Cal Ripken, uh, Boog Powell, Eddie Murphy, uh, Frank Robinson, great players, uh, Jim Palmer, incredible. Uh, today, um, you, you have an owner who is a very nice man. He's owned it for a long time, but you know, he's now 87 or 88 and may not have the same you know, focus on it that he had when he first bought it years ago. Mm. So I suspect at some point there will be some ownership transfer, and then you get some fresh blood in. I don't know what he's going to do. He might live for to be 110 for all I know. But um, you know, I think probably sometimes the fresh blood helps out, and so maybe if there's a change in ownership at some point uh, when it's appropriate, uh, maybe that will bring uh, you know, some success. I don't know. Thank you. Now, I would like to uh, open things up for questions. Erin in the back has a microphone. If you raise your hand, uh, she'll come to you with it. Who would like to ask a question? Here in the front. Oh, and please uh, make your questions in the form of a question. Uh, thank you. Ms. Rubenstein, I think uh, your career has probably been like my favorite Churchill quote, which is, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. Right. It's going from um, law to politics to government right. and then to business here in, in D.C. My startup, uh, helpfirst.com, is at 1776, and we're not known for startups here in D.C. Right. What, what advice would you give? To a start for a startup in D.C.? Yes, sir. Well, there is a view that uh, you have to be in Silicon Valley to start a lot of these great companies. And in fact, so much of the venture capital money is in Silicon Valley. In fact, probably 80% of all venture capital money is just in three different areas in the United States. It's a very uh, uh, strange situation. So Washington, D.C. is not a place that's known for startups, to be honest. Uh, and very often you get companies that are, get started here, they might move out to Silicon Valley because they think there's more uh, capability of actually growing the company there. Um, companies take off if you've got a great founder with a good idea and they just keep persisting and persisting and persisting. And uh, you, you never know what company is going to take off. You just don't know. But um, obviously, 
you know, if you're persistent and the idea has reasonable merit, you probably will get somewhere, but um, you just can't give up. You can't take no for an answer. So I don't know how long you've been at it. In my own case, I recognize my own failings. I wasn't that good as a lawyer, so I got out of it. I wasn't that good at, in government, and I got out of it. Uh, I got in the business and, you know, better at that maybe, but I got lucky in many ways. But you have to find something you're really passionate about. If you're passionate about your company, eventually it'll probably will take off. I hope. Sir, this gentleman here. Thank you. You mentioned uh, globalization and uh, the trade uh, deficit. I wanted to ask you uh, whether you think what we're doing in the way of trade adjustment uh, for the people who are dislocated by right. uh, trading things is adequate and whether the uh, responsibility uh, of roles by government, uh, business, and the education establishment is uh, what it should be. Yeah, the, the United States government's been trying for 30, 40 years, even since when I was in the government, to do something called trade adjustment assistance, which is designed to help people who've been displaced by, let's say, manufacturing jobs ship, shifting off, offshore. I don't think it's really ever worked all that well. I don't think the government is uh, just capable of doing it in a way that makes people who are the recipients of this assistance feel it's really changing their lives for the better. It's not that easy to get people to uh, learn a new skill and to get a, uh, or, or, or to get a new um, you know, kind of job. So I don't really think it's working that effectively, to be honest. And uh, the people who have been the most hard hit are probably people who are in their 50s and 60s who are not easily able to be retrained. They're not really willing to remove. Let's suppose you're... You have three kids, you're 50 years old, you get laid off, your company moves the jobs to China or something. Or is that 50-year-old with three kids uh, and his spouse, or assuming it's a man that we're talking about in this case, is he really going to pick up and move to California or Texas? It's harder to do. Can he find a job? Can he retrain himself? It's not easy to do. I, 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 I wish uh, I had a good answer for it. I don't. Rob here in the front. Mr. Rubenstein, let me thank you firstly sure. for the, your uh, commitment to the preservation of history in this country. Um, I, I say this as an immigrant uh, to this country. Where are I, you from? Uh, from the United Kingdom. Um, and I currently run the George C. Marshall Foundation in Lexington, Virginia, that perpetuates the memory of another great American hero. It has always struck me that in a country that reveres great men like Marshall and Washington, there is a disjuncture between that reverence and that understanding in, uh, of their heroic nature, and that study of history that you just alluded to, the lack of knowledge of history. Why do you think that is, and what can we do about it? Well, a couple of reasons. I think we don't know history as much. Uh, uh, I think in Europe, uh, there's a much greater... People tend to study history much more than they do, and I think you know, it'd be rare to find somebody who's a British citizen who wouldn't know the history of their country uh, reasonably well. In this country, in recent years, we have been obsessed with the competition with China, and that means uh, we need to make more engineers and more scientists and so forth. So we focus a lot on STEM. Uh, we don't have an equivalent focus on history. People aren't saying, you better learn history or you're not going to get a good job. Um, so I think uh, that's one problem. Secondly, um, I, I, I think that we don't tend to teach civics courses as much anymore. It used to be the case that civics was taught everywhere. Now there are only nine states in the country, plus the District of Columbia, that requires somebody to take a civics course before you graduate from high school. And that's uh, a problem, so people don't tend to, to, to be educated in school very much anymore. Um, it's, it's a sad situation. When you ask most Americans history questions, they don't tend to know very much about it. I, I wish I could give you an easy answer. I think you're going to have to have the state um, education um, bureaus or divisions forcing people to take more history courses to graduate from college or from, from uh, high school, but we just don't tend to do that right now. Um, this lady in the front. Um, speaking as someone who decided to major in history in college, um, my favorite assignment from eighth grade was that I had to take the citizenship test. And those okay. of us who didn't do all that great on it <laughs> had to retake it at the end of the year to see if we'd learned anything. Okay. So that was one of my favorite assignments from uh, when I was in eighth grade. Um, but my question is, um, I share that same love of history that you also have. And I personally feel like almost everything in the world has, you have to learn history to know how to do it. If you're going to be a biologist, you got to learn the history of biology, don't you? Um, but I wanted to ask, I'm sure you get 
so, so many proposals for things just because of how well you're known as a patriotic philanthropist. And I was curious, what stands out to you in a proposal for funding? And what, what just makes that something seem sparkly to you in terms of wanting to fund it? Well, you have a proposal? So I don't. No. <laughs> um, sure, I could come look, up with one. But. Um, like most people, I like my own ideas better than somebody else's yeah. ideas. So most of the stuff that I fund are things that I more or less came up with as an idea and decided to do it. So I decided that at the Kennedy Center that we should build an addition that made it better. So that was my idea, really. And so I you know, fund that. Um, or Washington Monument or other things like that. They were kind of my ideas. But when people, I do get proposals. I get roughly $50 million of requests, more or less a month, of serious requests. And you know that's a lot to handle. And I try to review them. I don't have a staff. I don't have a foundation. I do it all myself. I try to res respond as nicely, as politely as I can. But generally, I'm looking for, um, let's say in the history area, something where I can start something that, will, um, that hasn't been done before, I can finish something that isn't otherwise going to get finished, and I'm likely to see the, the results of whatever I give money to um, in my lifetime. So um, that's what I, how I often look at these things. And I also want to find things where I can be intellectually challenged and be engaged. So I don't tend to like to write checks and not get involved. So I'm on a lot of boards for that reason, because I want to stay involved. Um, but you know, it's, it's a, my problem is I don't have as much money as some of the other people who are well-known philanthropists. And I, ask all of you to think about this. I'm sure you'll laugh at this prospect, but the truth is, uh, what would you do if you had a staggering amount of money? So let's suppose you're, you're Bill Gates. You have $100 billion to give away. And all of a sudden, I give each of you $100 billion. So what would you do with $100 billion? Well, first you go buy some planes and yachts and houses and artwork and jewelry or whatever you might want. But then you've got you know, $999 billion and a half to go. You have $99.5 <laughs> billion. Dollars. What would you do with that? Well. Bill Gates had this problem, and he basically decided to do two things, K-12 in the United States and health in uh, emerging markets and, and poor countries. I don't know what I would do if I had $99.5 billion. Um, you could think about what would you all do if you had that much money to give away? What problems would you try to solve? You can't spend $99.5 billion. And you know, in my case, I don't have that much money, but what I try to do is figure out what difference I can actually make. And I often look at myself and say, OK, um, I got lucky uh, in business. I didn't expect to be in business. I got lucky. I'm now going to try to give back to society. What can I do with my limited resources relative to Bill Gates or so and have an impact? And so you want to have some impact and, and so forth. And the standard I often use was uh, when I was building my company, my mother never called me and said, hey, that's a great thing. You just took a company public. You made three times your money. But when I started giving away the money, she would call me and say, that's a good thing. You've actually done something useful with your life. And so I've adopted what I call the mother test. If your mother calls you and says, you're doing something useful, then you know you've done something good for your life. <laughs> But I do ask people this to uh, be very serious. Um, think about this. Um, let's suppose tomorrow uh, you had to write your own obituary. What would you want written in there, and what would you write? Uh, this is a situation that uh, Alfred Nobel uh, faced. Um, Alfred Nobel invented dynamite. And um, he was not that popular because a lot of people were killed by dynamite, peaceful but also in warlike uh, cir circumstances. So one day, his brother died. And the newspaper in Stockholm got it wrong. And they wrote the obituary of Alfred Nobel. And they said, the, 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 the murderer, the man who's uh, destroyed so many lives, has just died. And so he sat there that morning, knowing that his brother had died, but he read his own obituary. And he wasn't happy with it. So he resolved to do something that would change the obituary when he actually did die. And he came up, obviously, with the Nobel Prize and so forth. But if each of you were to write your own obituary, what would you want said about what you did with your time on the face of the earth? So everybody you know, has some pride, I guess, in what they've done. But I, I ask people to think about what you want people to think about you and what you have done. And if you haven't done enough and you're going to write your obituary today, you're not happy with it, do something that gives back to society, makes a contribution to humanity, and justifies your own existence on the face of the earth uh, for the, the time that you're here. So, I just ask everybody to think about what you can do that would make a difference in your society, your neighborhood, your, your, your community, your state, your country. And then maybe people will do more of those kind of things. And I try to think about that all the time. And, and when I'm looking at proposals, what can I do that will actually make a difference? And will this proposal be something that will make a difference in, in some way that will help other people? Excellent. Stacy. 
First of all, if I'm ever lucky enough to be a contestant on Jeopardy, I do not want to compete against you. <laughs> not that hard. Um, in light of what you were just talking about where history is concerned, what are your thoughts about this current trend of taking statues down that people find offensive? It's a very complicated situation because um, in the ancient world, for example, if you go over to certain parts of the world that, and you find something that's 100 years old, 500 years old, 1,000 years old, 2,000 years old, we revere it. We don't want to change it. We, don't, we want to preserve it. Why? Because we can learn more about what these people were like uh, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. So if you see an ancient Greek or ancient Egyptian kind of thing, you want to preserve it. Uh, these uh, monuments that we're talking about are typically, what we're really talking about are people that, um, uh, that were part of the Confederacy and, and they were more or less uh, people that supported, let's say, slavery. And so it's a complicated issue because uh, some of the people who are revered in the South were revered for things other than their love of slavery. So I think Robert E. Lee, for example, um, was revered for many things and you know, his slavery wasn't his main cause in, in life, though he obviously led the, the Confederacy. Some of the, or a large percentage of the Confederate statues that we're now talking about were put up in the 1900s when it was really designed to be an anti, um, uh, I would say, black kind of uh, statement. It, was, it wasn't so much to revere um, Robert E. Lee, but let's say it was to, designed to make a statement in favor of whites. And so in those cases, it's a more challenging kind of situation. So I think each one has to be looked at on its own. Um, I, I do know that you, if you go back in through history and change everybody's, I'm not, I'm not defending slavery, obviously, but if you go back in, and, 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 and take today's moral standards and apply it to people in the past, you have some problems. So George Washington was a slave owner. Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. Uh, um, James Madison was a slave owner. In fact, nine of the first 11 presidents of the United States were slave owners. One third of the people at the Constitutional Convention were slave owners. So if we say, how could you have been a slave owner? Uh, it's terrible. And then we, we take away some of the, the people who are heroes of our country. So it's a very complicated issue. I wish I had the answer for it. I, I do think that some of the monuments that were designed mostly to be anti-African-American um, uh, and clearly were done in the 20th century are probably not as um, historically significant as something that might have been done you know, at the time the person really died but I don't have an easy answer for it. And as a chairman of the Smithsonian, we struggle with this um, you know, all the time because we often have things that you know, are now controversial. Hmm. We have a lady here near the front. Yes. Thank you so much, sure. Lucy Associates yes. in Central Park. Uh, just following up to what you said about chairman of the Smithsonian, I happen to be a huge admirer of Davis Colton. He's a terrific. So when you hired him, what are the qualities attracted to you? Okay. And the second is, with regard to Supreme Court justice, I am hu a huge admirer of Justice Breyer. How were you and Ambassador Eisenstadt was able to persuade President Carter to put Justice Breyer's name? <laughs> because at that time, he was working for okay. Senator Kennedy. It was yeah, not well, necessarily okay. a friend of President well, Carter. Let me explain. Thank okay. you. Uh, for those who don't know, the Smithsonian Institution um, was actually an interesting institution the way it was set up. A man named James Smithson, who was an illegitimate son of a British lord, died in 1829, and he left $500,000 uh, to the creation of an institution for the increase in diffusion of knowledge in the United States. Now, he had never been to the United States. And in 1829, you know, it was only 15 years after the British burned down the White House. So people here are saying, wait a second, is this a Trojan horse? What are they trying to do? What's this all about? So the Congress, in its infinite wisdom, debated for about a year whether we should take the money, 500000 <laughs> Finally, Congress decided to do it. They sent them a delegation over. They got the $500,000 in coins. They brought it back. And then uh, they promptly didn't know what to do with it because they hadn't figured out what the Smithsonian Institution was supposed to be. So they invested it in Arkansas state bonds. It went bankrupt very quickly. So they lost all the 500000 Then the Congress debated should they replenish the money. And they finally, because of the persuasive talents of John Quincy Adams, then in the House, they did uh, replenish it. Um, and then the Smithsonian was built and now has 19 museums, nine research centers. Obviously, uh, all the museums are for free because the federal government supports it now, about two-thirds of the budget. David Scorton is now the secretary. That's the equivalent of being president or CEO. And um, he was the president of Cornell for, I think, eight or nine years before that president of University of Iowa. He's a uh, cardiologist by training. 
but very, very um, much of a um, you know, Renaissance man. And when we were looking for somebody to replace the interim person, Wayne Clough, we were looking for somebody that knows how to run a large institution, that knows how to ask for money, that's very smart, knows how to manage a staff, is a good public speaker, and those are the qualities we were looking for, and David has those. So he done an excellent job uh, at the Smithsonian, but it's not an easy place to run because you have all these museums and, and research centers, and it's spread all over the country, but also around the world in many cases. Um, so uh, he's done an excellent job. And the other thing you're referring to is this. Um, there's a justice on the Supreme Court named Justice Breyer. Justice Breyer um, is a graduate of Stanford, Harvard Law School, was a Harvard Law School professor. Uh, Ted Kennedy was a senator from Massachusetts, and he persuaded Jim Breyer to come down and help him on something called deregulation legislation. Liberals in the United States were generally not in favor of deregulation. Ted Kennedy changed that, and he said, now actually we should deregulate trucking and deregulate airlines and deregulate some parts of, of our uh, economy. And he had Breyer as his uh, law professor who was working on it. At the end, after Carter had, had uh, lost the election in 1980, um, Carter wanted to still get some justice, some, some people on the Court of Appeals, the First Circuit in Boston. And uh, the, the idea was that Carter was going to nominate a Democrat who had worked for Ted Kennedy. So Carter, a Democratic president who wasn't going to be around after the um, inauguration of Reagan, uh, the Senate was no longer going to be Democratic after the 1980 election. Breyer was a Democrat. The chairman of the Judiciary Committee was going to be Strom Thurmond. And so how could Breyer get confirmed at the lame duck session of Congress? Well, uh, what happened was that Breyer, when he worked on the staff, had befriended uh, Thurmond's state, uh, people. And then Carter uh, worked really with Ted Kennedy to persuade Strom Thurmond that Breyer deserved to be on the court. He got on the First Circuit, later became the chief judge of the First Circuit, and now obviously on the Supreme Court, put there by Bill Clinton. So it was a matter of, uh, of an unusual situation that wouldn't happen today where a Republican said, yes, a Democrat can actually be a good person, and so we'll uh, <laughs> give him this judgeship. We have time for one more very quick question. This gentleman here in the purple shirt. Thank you. As um, big data becomes a really interesting field, how do you believe that it can apply to history with regards to accessibility and revision? Well, big data, and art, which is another phrase for artificial intelligence, I suppose, is um, you can, uh, in all parts of society, with the, the, the data that is available, you can um, get searches done much more quickly. We have search engines now, but just think about this. In the old days, when I was in, in college, if you wanted to learn something, you had to actually go to the library. I assume they have physical libraries still. Libraries, right check here. the books out, <laughs> you know, make sure you had the copies of the books, you know, get copies of, of the things you wanted, and actually uh, do all the research yourself in some ways. Now, with search engines, you can short circuit a lot of it. You can get access to things. So you don't need to come to a physical library. You can do research um, by going online and getting the best resources of the Library of Congress or other great libraries. So that has been very helpful. I think in, in the future, big data will enable you to do research much more quickly. And I don't know all the details of how it will work, but I think it will enable people to get access to things and have analysis done much more rapidly than, than is the, the case today. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's all the time we have for this evening. I just wanted to quickly alert you that we have a marvelous new exhibition opening at the Folger Shakespeare Library in October called Churchill's Shakespeare. Uh, the Folgers partnered with the International Churchill Society uh, to fund this exploration of the influence that Shakespeare had on the life, the leadership, and the writings of okay, Winston tell Churchill. Us one Churchill joke or something? I, oh, please, yeah. I one I told you before, I guess it would work. It won't work here. Um, well, work. we're not on C-SPAN, so. Well, we're not. Yeah, so you go, go right ahead. It'll, so, it'll make, it'll, it, people will be talking about it for days. The second one is easier than the first one. <laughs> um, so here's a Churchill story, and there are millions of them, and some of them are actually apocryphal, some of them are true. You probably know all of them. I mean, my, you can top my Churchill stories, but I'll give you <laughs> one Churchill story, which has happened in, in Virginia. So Churchill was former prime minister. He's a little older. Um, you know, he was, he was elected prime minister first time, I think, when he was 65, mm -hmm. and uh, his second time he was probably... Closer to 80 or something? He was 76. 76, mm -hmm. okay. So uh, when he retired and, and was no longer prime minister and, and so forth, um, he came over and visited uh, Richmond, Virginia. And so he, he was being led around, I guess, by a dowager 
lady who was a member of society, and they were, she was trying to help him get his food. And so um, she said, uh, Mr. Churchill, uh, what would you like in this buffet? I'll get the food for you. And he said, well, so I, I'll have some of that chicken breast. She said, oh, uh, Mr. Churchill, we don't use the word, uh, that word in polite society. That's uh, white meat. We call it white meat. Okay, can I have some of that white meat? Okay, so he got some of the white meat. He had it. And the next day, he left. And then he said a corsage to the lady, saying, uh, thank you very much for your hospitality. It was a wonderful dinner. Please put this corsage on your white meat. <laughs> I can tell the other one. but I And it's I true. Don't. No, we'll, 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 we'll tell the other there. one later, maybe right, in okay. private. Um, please join us tomorrow, same time, same place, for the British Member of Parliament, Jesse Norman, who will discuss his new biography called Adam Smith, Father of Economics. And please join me in thanking David Rubenstein for a fascinating evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir.